Hello class, welcome to the final segment in lecture 15 and in this final segment we're going to take the concept of potential vorticity that we introduced in the previous segment and see what that actually means for the atmosphere and specifically what happens to uh, our flow pattern as it goes from west to east over the Rockies which is what we advertised we were going to cover. So uh, let's go ahead and dive right into that but first let's also discuss a little bit or just quickly review what we talked about when we introduced potential vorticity. So again we introduced potential vorticity as this quantity being potential vorticity equals the absolute vorticity times d theta, which is potential temperature over dp, which is pressure. And again, this is uh, basically a stability term. It represents how stable the atmosphere is. And uh, essentially, you can also rewrite that as just the absolute vorticity zeta plus f. Again, f is just the Coriolis parameter, which represents Earth's vorticity or the vorticity caused by Earth's rotation. That's just equal to zeta plus f divided by the depth of the column in question. And since potential vorticity is a conserved quantity, that means that we can invoke a conservation rule, which is more of a mathematical statement than anything else, and that is that the potential vorticity before must be equal to the potential vorticity afterwards. Or breaking that down into the individual terms, that means the absolute vorticity divided by the column depth before must be equal to the absolute vorticity divided by the column depth afterwards. And in this final segment, we're going to use this conservation rule to explain one of the processes that takes place in the atmosphere, and that is the process that is often referred to as Lee troughing or Lee cyclogenesis. So for this conceptual model, we're going to be considering a purely zonal flow pattern. And since this flow pattern is purely zonal, that means we're going to be working at a constant latitude, which means the Coriolis parameter f, which also represents Earth's vorticity, that is just going to be a constant. And we're going to be focusing on a wind pattern that starts over the elevated terrain, we'll say in Utah somewhere, goes up over the uh, Rocky Mountains, and then comes down into the plains on the other side. And here we're going to focus on three different points, which are labeled here. Point A, which is the higher terrain to the west of the Rockies. Point B, which is the apex of the Rocky Mountains. And then point C, which is the relatively flat lands that we know and love and that we call the Great Plains. So that's a bit of a top-down view. Now let's actually go to a bit more of a cross-sectional view so that we can better visualize what's going on. So again, since we're talking about a purely zonal flow pattern, that means we're going to be working at a constant latitude, which means that the Coriolis parameter is just a nice constant. So we don't really have to worry about how that changes. And again, we're going to start with a pattern that goes from west to east. Uh, one thing I should also point out is this is purely a look at the dynamics involved. It also turns out that there are some thermodynamics that also kind of play a role in this process of forming a cyclone over the eastern side of the mountains, but, uh, or, or yeah, just forming a cyclone due to the zonal flow pattern, but we're focusing mainly on the dynamics, and the thermodynamics will be something you'll talk about, behind this will be something you talk about in some of your later meteorology coursework. But if we take the, let's say we have a nice column of air, and just for the sake of simplicity, and for the sake of illustrating what's going on, we'll just assume that this column of air has a relative vorticity of zero, so it's not rotating at all. And we're going to move this column of air over the Rockies, so we're going to move it over the mountains where the depth of this column is going to decrease. And in fact, as an exercise, I'll go ahead and uh, ask you to pause the video and try to work out using this conservation principle, try to work out what's going to happen to our relative vorticity zeta as this column from point A goes over point B and as that column uh, the depth of that column decreases. So I'll give you a few seconds to pause the video and work through that. So hopefully the answer that you got is going to resemble the answer that I'm about to articulate. So as this column of air over point A comes over the Rocky Mountains, the depth of it, de the depth of this column decreases, which means delta zeta or <laughs> delta zeta, delta z in this denominator decreases, which in order for this equation to be balanced, so again, zeta is just zero to begin with, which means all you have to worry about on the left-hand side at the previous time is just the planetary vorticity F divided by the column depth delta Z. So we get some number from that on the left-hand side. Now, in order to maintain that balance, we have to make sure that the right-hand side is, of course, the same as the left-hand side. If delta Z decreases, in order to maintain that equality, that also means the numerator must also decrease. But if f is constant, then the only thing in this numerator that can decrease 
would be the only thing they can decrease the numerator is if we decrease the value of zeta here. So if we decrease the column death delta z, that means we also decrease zeta. And if zeta was zero to begin with, decreasing zeta will give us a negative value of zeta, which would imply that we've got a clockwise circulation developing on top of the Rockies, which in the northern hemisphere would imply the presence of a high pressure system, since high pressure systems or anticyclones rotate in the clockwise direction in the northern hemisphere. But now we're going to bring this column from point B over point C, where the depth of this column is going to increase again, and it's going to increase, uh, the depth of the column at point C is going to be greater than the depth of the column than it was at point A. So again, go ahead and pause the video and try to resolve what's going to happen to zeta as this column of air comes out over point C and where the depth increases again. So again, hopefully the answer that you got is going to resemble what I'm about to articulate. So as this column of air comes over point C, delta Z increases again. And again, just to, main to maintain this balance here, whatever's on the left-hand side must equal what's on the right-hand side. And at points A, B, and C, the number that you get from plugging into this potential vortex equation, if you were to plug in numbers, you should get the same number at points A, B, and C. So if I go from point A to point C, or even point B to point C, my column depth is increasing. So in order to maintain this balance, if my column depth is increasing, that means the numerator in this fraction must also be increasing. And if f is constant, then the only way to increase this numerator is to increase the value of zeta. And if we increase the value of zeta, that means that we develop, in the northern hemisphere, we develop a counterclockwise circulation, which would imply the presence of a cyclone in the northern hemisphere. And just sort of a mathematical illustration of that. So here, again, we just assume no vortices, vortices to start with, which in the real atmosphere is probably not a good assumption, but it's good enough for this conceptual model. As the air goes over the Rocky Mountains, the vorticity decreases, which means it starts spinning in the, the uh, direction of a high pressure system in the clockwise direction. And then as the column comes out over point C, the vorticity becomes positive, which then implies that we have a counterclockwise circulation or a low pressure system in the Northern hemisphere. So, just using the concept of potential vorticity, this allows us to explain how we can get a cyclone that forms on the east side of the Rockies, which is more technically referred to as the least side of the Rockies, and how we can get a high pressure system that forms over the Rocky Mountains itself. And in practice, due to some other physical processes, typically this high pressure actually ends up about here. It kind of hangs out on the west side of the mountains, but Again, there's other thermodynamic processes involved here that we're not really taking into account just yet. We're only looking at the dynamic response. And it turns out that as the air goes up the mountains, it cools. And then you've also got uh, compressional warming as it comes back over the other side of the mountain. But uh, we're not going to worry about that just yet. This is just only looking, you're just most only focusing on the dynamics involved and how those dynamics can actually produce a cyclone on the east side or on the lee side of the Rockies and an anticyclone on the west side of the Rockies or right on top of the Rockies. And this also holds true for any mountain range. I know I've been saying the Rockies a lot just because uh, we, uh, we live in the, uh, some of us enjoy being in the plains and the Rockies are uh, really nice for this process. In fact, uh, a lot of severe weather events in the plains are driven by these lee cyclones, but uh, That'll actually be a topic we talk about a little bit later on. But uh, I know I've been saying Rockies, but this also holds true for any mountain range. If you've got zonal flow over any mountain range or any elevated terrain, then you will see this. Uh, you will see the same response. So that's going to do it for this lecture on barotropic, baroclinic atmosphere, as well as potential vorticity and some of the other related topics. So with that, I will see you all in the next lecture.